Next, I am delighted to introduce a very good friend of FOSI, Mr. Jules Polonetsky, the CEO of the Future of Privacy Forum, a think tank focused on advancing responsible data practices. He will introduce a joint FPF FOSI white paper entitled Kids in the Connected Home, the Benefit, and I see we have some connected devices here. Um, Kids in the Connected Home, the Benefits and Privacy Implications of Connected Dolls, Talking Dinosaurs, and Battling Robots. Um, so it should be an interesting presentation. Uh, you can find a link to the paper at our conference app, foceconference.org. So Jules. Thank you, Sarah. Steven, great to see so many friends here this morning. Um, and I, I was cheered up by seeing some folks I hadn't seen in a while because I had some bad news this morning. I, um, I got on my Wi-Fi scale, which I get on uh, every morning, and it's a smart scale. So it updates, it connects to remote servers, and it's my personal little way to kind of keep in touch with what actually is sort of happening every single day in the world of technology because this scale keeps updating. And uh, I used to get on and it would give me my weight and I could take a look and, and see it on the app later in the day. Um, you know, when you're on the scale, you, you're like, you're in your underwear, right? You don't want that extra like four ounces of your like t-shirt or anything like that. And so um, you're, you're standing there and it now uh, started giving me the weather. When I look down, it says it gives you the weight and then it gives you the weather, which is kind of useful because you haven't really gotten dressed yet. So that was kind of cool. But I was like, wow, it just got some new features auto automatically just turn that on. That's kind of interesting. What will it do tomorrow? So uh, I got on just uh, recently and it has a new feature now. It, it has, after it shows you your weight uh, and it shows you the weather, it then shows you this little trend line showing how you have done over the last couple of uh, days or weeks. Well, it's after Thanksgiving. So I jumped on and all of a sudden here's this like trend line in the morning, like starting off my day with this kind of like, uh, beware. So it's kind of useful, but it got me thinking, right? Cause like what else is in there? I mean, I don't think it has a microphone or a camera, but what new features are going to update? Um, and am I going to know about them and will they be collecting information about me and my underwear or my family or, or my kids or other information about me. And so as we started looking at connected toys, we sort of had in mind, okay, really fun, interesting stuff, but what are the implications? And by the way, are we covered by the relevant um, uh, uh, privacy laws? I have two young teens and you know they squabble a little bit and I um, had an Amazon uh, Echo uh, in my house and they've been enjoying it. And then we just got the Google Home um, device and I was a little worried about how these two would get along with each other. And um, it turns out the, the older sibling, the Echo, pretty much ignores the, the, um, uh, the Google device. You know, if you say, well, what do you think of, uh, you know, Google Home? It's like, I don't have any information on that. But the Google device, the younger sibling, which we just got and is a little bit newer to the market, it has all kinds of little catchy comebacks and sort of funny asides. It says, well, the, you know, Echo is sort of tall and slim with that cool blue light, but you know, I'm kind of cozy in here. It has these little sort of remarks. And I'm thinking, okay, my how, this is not yet science fiction, but different things in my house are talking to each other and having this little sort of side uh, conversation. Okay, interesting, as I start thinking about my kids interacting with these things. Um, but they're jaded, they're kids, they're, they're like, you know, looking at their phones and pads, and, and they, they really look up, they like playing music on the smart devices. But when I brought home Chip, the smart dog, um, they actually paid attention. He doesn't look all that exciting now because he's not connected uh, to anything. But in addition to following commands, he recognizes their voices. Uh, when he does things that you like, you give it a little like on a little bracelet, and he learns that that's what you like. He even does yoga, which I'll maybe demonstrate later when we have him on the table. He will actually you say, Chip, do yoga, and he barks to let you know he knows. Um, and then the coolest thing is when his battery's low, on his own, he decides to go take a walk, and he goes over to his charging station in the corner, and he kind of pops his butt down, and he starts charging himself, right? So not science fiction, not that expensive. Um, yeah, I get to spend the company budget on playing with this kind of stuff, so it's <laughs> actually a lot of fun. But I guess, and I don't know if any of you have seen Steven. Steven's been traveling around with this dyno who is actually connected to IBM's Watson, you know, supercomputing, and it does some phenomenal things and can answer the most unique and remarkable questions that your kid answers. So let's start analyzing this because I find that when we start looking at some of the industry definitions, uh, which are, you know, focused on what is the business category and so forth. So the, the, the titles that the industry gives are sort of toys to life and sort of robotics. 
from our point of view, as folks who care about privacy and data, we realized that we had to start categorizing him a bit differently because um, Chip is awfully smart, but he actually doesn't connect to the internet. Now, he connects to a little ball that he can chase around, he can follow you, and so forth, but his processing is all packed into this device. And for many of us, technology and toys isn't anything new. We all know about, you know, pull string, uh, you know, talking dolls or, you know, in, in some, somewhat uh, remote controlled race cars and the like. So not brand new, but what is new is the amount of processing and intelligence that we can put into this device that then interacts with my child. If it's not connecting to the internet, however, it's not gonna be covered by COPPA and the privacy issues are different, right? Obviously we care about this sociologically, how is this thing interacting with my child, but it's when this thing gets online, when it's connected to the internet, when it uses uh, HTTP, that the COPPA drafters had that sharing data remotely uh, online. Okay, so I guess we've answered the first question. We've seen Senator Warner write to the FTC, we've seen people start asking questions well, these aren't websites, they're not apps. We know that the FTC has made it very clear that COPPA covers those, but what about a teddy bear you know, with a chip in it? Is it covered? And our conclusion from the report, which I hope you'll take a look at, was certainly, if you look closely at the language, when it's connected to the internet, when it is an online service, it certainly is. And I know a lot of people grumbled back when the uh, FTC interpreted the COPPA rule to include IP addresses, right? We said, don't they know you just collect an IP address when you go to the site and so on and so forth? At the end of the day, it may have been prescient because some of these things, even if they aren't sending any other information when they're connecting to the internet, they are obviously sending IP address, so they end up being caught by COPPA. Now, if that's all they do, they may be carved out and subject to some exceptions and not uh, come along with a host of requirements, but that actual change, in, in the end of the day, has the COPPA role uh, sweeping really, really broadly. Okay, so smart doesn't mean connected, and connected doesn't mean smart, right? the device can just be farly, uh, remotely controlled. The most powerful devices are both smart and connected because they're using cloud computing so they actually can understand your child, different accents if we want them to understand kids with different abilities to speak and the like, different languages, we wanna be inclusive. Certainly the power of cloud computing to be able to provide those responses and to do it in a way that's understandable is critical. All right, so the second question that people raise is, yeah, but COPPA, I go, I fill in a form, I get verified consent, where? Where's the screen? So how can you possibly get permission? Well, the reality is most of these things are controlled by apps and certainly apps are covered by COPPA. Plus that's where these devices typically uh, go to let you hook them up to the internet. So maybe one day they'll have some screens and we'll worry about whether you can sort of peck in your verified consent there today. But today all the devices we looked at seem to be clearly and easily seeking consent by using related apps that give that the power. So I don't know that we need a COPPA update there. I think we do have uh, a pretty wide scope when we look at the language and we can be pretty sure that these things are uh, covered. Well, what about that Echo and that Google Home uh, device, these sort of general devices? They're, my kids are in the house. They are interacting with my kids. Of course, they're interacting with our entire family. And when the drafters of COPPA debated the issue, Clearly there were going to be websites or services that had broad audiences. And of course, there are always going to be some kids in that audience. And folks did debate, well, is there some way that, well, if there's kids, maybe you need to figure out that. And of course the burden on users, as I think the drafters and, and the folks who thought about it said was, well, that means every single person to screen out maybe some minority of children, every single person is gonna to have to constantly be signing in and constantly verifying. So I'm certainly walking into my living room and I don't wanna to have to be uh, adult password, so now you can you know, talk to me and now this is one of my children. Well, they're getting voice, or the other way of course that COPPA kicks in, in addition to making a decision as to whether or not this thing is aimed and targeted at children. Of course, if we had a you know, echo for kids, that would be a different story, but the general home pieces, I think the FTC has been pretty clear. But the other way that you end up, of course, as many of you know, get captured by Copper's uh, jurisdiction is wh whether you have actual knowledge, right? So even if I'm aimed at that general audience, if I ask for age and I know age, then I'm obviously on the hook. We're talking, these things are listening. So isn't my kid's personal information being identified and recognized? So the reality is what these devices, as smart as they are today, typically do, frankly, is not voice recognition. They do speech recognition, right? They learn words. They are by no means yet sophisticated enough, maybe one day, to tell the difference between a nine-year-old squeaky-voiced boy and a you know, 12-year-old and a 15-year-old or a high-pitched 
male voice or a high-pitched adult voice. Impossible today, and today the companies actually don't technically in any way yet have actual knowledge. Maybe in the future one day, because my kids can actually say things to the device, maybe I want my kids, my wife, my cousin who comes in, maybe I would like different accounts, uh, and I do want maybe some biometric relationship. So I assume we'll debate sort of the pros and cons of biometrics, but one day the technology may get us there. But today I think it's pretty clear that these are general home devices and that they're not aimed at kids and that they don't have actual knowledge. And so these are some of the questions I think that are being raised. So all of you know that when you interact uh, with COPPA, uh, as you start being asked for personal information, that's where we're presented the notice. So uh, I think we bought these online, but lots of people are gonna be buying these in stores. Now, what good is it if you buy something in the store and you take it home and it only works if you connect it online and you create an account and you have your kids' information going to the cloud and it says, okay, do you give permission? What are you gonna do? Oh, I didn't know that, I didn't really wanna do that. Well, you got it already, it's home, it's in that box, right? So one of the things we call for in the report is, you know what, can we give you a clue? I don't know that I want a privacy policy on the box in the store, no one's gonna read that, but could we make sure that people making these purchases, if it's gonna be dependent on sharing personal information, kind of too late when my kid is yelling, set it up, set it up, what do you mean you don't wanna give permission? Now, is that feasible? Is that possible? We're asking people to put like notices on boxes? No, but there's some smart ways to do this, and let's take a look. So this is not a tiny little startup, this is Fisher Price, and sure enough, on the box it says, Hey, mom and dad, you'll be glad to know, no personally identifiable information is transmitted by this smart toy. Good news yet, right? Another company might say, maybe something like, hey, needs an online account in order to activate all the features of the like, right? Just so that parents have some clue and can make a smart decision. So that's something I think not required by COPPA, which, but which I think would be practical and would be uh, uh, really, um, uh, really uh, useful. Okay. A couple other key last tips. Security, right? We've all read about these DDoS attacks where uh, items, uh, home cameras and so forth were used to attack. Imagine your home toys being used to, you know, be involved in uh, attacks. Um, we, we, the policy and, and advocacy community, need to, need to make sure that we understand what to be asking the manufacturers and the toy providers to do. I was among many who, when I heard about Hello Barbies, oh, how could that, oh my God, oh my God, what's gonna happen? Bad people will come in and you know, interact with my kids uh, or, or turn Barbie into a, you know, a fierce uh, uh, you know, microphone in the home. And then when we actually looked really closely at it, they did an amazing amount of really smart, careful technical security work. So one video of one of the leading hackers saying, I've been able to get into just every smart home device except for two, and one of those was you know, Hello Barbie. And so, we include a number of the tips because I think if we start looking at what we should be asking, right, is there a default password so the bad guys can get in? Can the parent change the password? Um, uh, is it only gonna communicate with whitelisted servers? So if my concern is that someone will push out an update, right, that will turn the friendly device into something that can, can talk or listen or do things that it isn't intended, well, it ought not to be communicating with other than the whitelisted servers. Um, maybe it should only get signed updates so that the bad actor can update it so that a microphone can be turned on remotely or those sorts of things. So in the report, which thanks to uh, the FPF staff and the FOSI staff who did a great uh, uh, job uh, pulling together, we go through a lot of the leading security tips that we hope will be useful for companies of different sizes to make sure that they are doing what they can do. Okay, one last tip. Do I have time for one tip? How am I doing? One tip, okay. So we talked about how these things have IP addresses, they have MAC addresses, which they are broadcasting, right? So there's a Wi-Fi network here. So if chip was on, the Wi-Fi network or the technical tools that lots of spaces like this, like airports, like retailers use to count how many phones are in the space or to understand how many people and how they move and navigate through stores Typical technology today obviously has, it's useful. We wanna know how long the lines are in the airports and this is the way that this data is collected, but it does mean that your phone and your device and yes, your toys, if your kids like mine took their favorite toys you know, with them out. So you want to make sure that it is possible if you're a manufacturer to separately turn off the Wi-Fi. A lot of these things, they wanna make it simple, right? You call in, I can't get it to work. Well, is the Wi-Fi on? So there often isn't a separate switch for Bluetooth or Wi-Fi because it's intended to be on. Well, give me that switch, maybe hide it so I don't accidentally turn it off, but hide it so I can turn it off. Or 
go ahead and opt out your device, or maybe the manufacturers might even opt out all their devices at the industry uh, page that allows folks who don't want their phones or other devices to be tracked in uh, public spaces to go ahead and do that. Anyway, we hope you'll take a look at the report. Thanks so much to the FOSI Dean for being a great partner in pulling together. We think there are lots of useful tips in there, and we're looking forward to the reaction from some of our FTC leaders to uh, uh, what they think. So thanks so much, Sarah, Stephen, thank all of you.